thinking deeply about a simple thing, right? Once you arrive at the quadratic formula, you kind of feel like, ah, oh, I got to like this result, and it is fantastically powerful. But you shouldn't just stop there and say, well, great, now I can use it. You should think about, well, what else does this reveal? Okay. So let's just jot down our result here. Is quadratic formula the title? Yeah. Okay. So what can we get out of this? First, let me um, remind you of something which I dealt with very, very briefly. And I said I'm going to do this a bit more in the future, a bit more formally. Now I'm doing it. We have noticed that underneath the square root, there's something very, very important, something decisive, in fact, right? It's so important it gets its own name, and I told it to you before, starts with a D? The discriminant, very good. So we say, we replace that with the, with the Greek delta for D, right? Um, so we can say this, where we define the discriminant as this awkward little term. You remember from completing the square where it came from, but that's what it is. Okay? Now, if you recall, when we were doing graphing, right, I said we determined that when you have certain kinds of graphs, right, like say this or this, particular kinds of things give you restrictions. right? So 1 over x, you've got a restriction. On the x, it can't be equal to 0. right? So that gives you a domain y equals log base 2 of x, there's another restriction on the x, namely that x has to be positive, right? Because 2 raised to any power, no matter what power you raise it to, won't give you a negative number, so therefore x must be positive. Okay. Now we also notice the other important category of functions which gave you restrictions was these guys, right? Uh, in this case, it's just slightly different from these, right? x can't equal 0, x also can't equal 0. x can equal to 0 for this. You can take the square root of zero, it's fine. But then after that you've got to go positive, right? So being that we have square roots and other kinds of functions giving us restrictions, that's what you notice here. Since the discriminant is underneath the square root, uh, it tells us some important things, okay? So let's try and get this down formally. Number one, so this is the discriminant. Depending on what you know about the discriminant, that will tell you very many useful properties of the quadratic you're looking at, right? Now this should ring some bells, but I'm going to go through this in more detail than we went before, okay? So firstly, if the discriminant's a positive number, and I do mean strictly positive, so that's not including zero, right? What that means is, you remember minus b on 2a in the quadratic formula, there's your axis of symmetry, right? And then plus or minus means go plus a little bit, minus a little bit to go to get your two roots, okay? So if you've got a positive discriminant, that means you're going a certain distance. And the bigger the discriminant is, the further away you're getting. Does that make sense? Okay. So a discriminant of zero means two distinct, meaning not at the same spot, right? not at the same value, two distinct um, real roots. And we'll come back to this meaning of real in a second. Okay. Two distinct real roots. They're not at the same spot. Alternatively, if the discriminant is exactly equal to zero, right? You're going from this axis of symmetry, right? Minus b on 2a. But then when you go plus or minus, you, you don't go anywhere because the discriminant's zero, right? So instead of getting two distinct roots, you can say this in one of two ways. You can say either you get one, what we call a double root. Okay, a double root because when you think about this, these roots here are different in nature to this root, right? They are actually doing different things, right? It's not just that I've got two of them and they're in the same spot. So we call them double root. Alternatively, you might see it written as two equal roots, right? There's root, and then there's another one on exactly the same spot, okay? And um, all, all as the as the couple weeks unfold and even in term four when we look at a new topic in extension two, um, you'll get to see some of the reason why some mathematicians like to say two equal roots even though quite obviously it only intersects once. It's a bit of a funny way to say it. Well there will be a really important reason why. Okay, now um, the screen is positive, the screen is equal to zero. There's another important thing uh, which is that for either of these, if the discriminant is exactly equal to a square number. If I have something under here, right, that ends up being a square root, sorry, a square number, when you take the square root, 
you won't have a third anymore, right? Because for example, if I have the square root of 25, okay, then the square root of 25 is just five. So I have all rational numbers up here. Now, I still might not have a whole number because depending on what 2a is, I still might have some kind of fraction in there, okay? But I'm not gonna have thirds anymore, right? So in other words, I have rational roots. The thirds go away. Just quickly going back to x squared plus 5x plus 6, you can get so much mileage out of a single quadratic, right? Let's work out the discriminant for x squared plus 5x plus 6, because you already know what the result is, right? For that, the discriminant is going to be x squared plus 5x plus 6. What's b squared? 25, right, because it's 5 squared, minus 4ac. You see it? By the way, just as a matter of my own personal convention. I write my 4ac like this. That's just to help me remember there's a 4 and then there's another thing and then there's another thing. Because sometimes, you know, it's so often monic that you forget to multiply by a. So I do this just to help me remember there's three things in there. Okay. So of course that's 25 minus 24, which is a square number, right? So there's your two roots, which you already knew. So that's all fine, okay? One more category. Positive, zero, negative. negative. Okay, so again, just like with the case, the discriminant sequence zero, there are two ways to say this. First, I could say um, no real roots. Okay, they just don't exist, right? So a classic example is the one I gave you just now. Y equals X squared plus one. Now, despite the fact that there's no B in there, B X, it's still in general form, right? A is equal to one, B is equal to zero, C is equal to 1. So in this case, what's the discriminant? Uh, the discriminant is minus 1. 0. Wait, hang on. That's B squared. No minus 4AC, right? So negative 4. Now, what does this mean? It tells you what you already knew, namely that this thing never collides with the x-axis. Because if it did, you'd have some values going on in here. But right now, you have something that breaks the square root. Okay? So I say no real roots. But another way to say this is, what I have is two, well, if roots aren't real, aren't you'd call them unreal. Okay. Now, two unreal <laughs> roots. Okay. Now, by the way, just as a, a little side note, and I'm not going to deal with it now because we will deal with it in term four, okay? it says something about the history of mathematics and how it's developed, that there are two categories of numbers that both literally seem to be making fun of those categories of numbers, right? That's not accidental. I don't think it's a good thing, but there's a real historical reason why they have those names. And to say something irrational means it doesn't make sense, right? Well, that's what the Greeks